A passage can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1650. 1650, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 9. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Brad. Now, at the beginning of every year as a church, we write down our growing in Christ goals, uh, often three of them. I wonder what, what's your hit rate in uh, how do you go with your three growing in Christ goals? Uh, generally, each year I'm about one from three. I, does anyone do better than that? Elizabeth, you'd do better than that, would you? Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, we, we work hard at these growing in Christ things, and uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure uh, uh, what, what your hit rate is. Um, one of the ones that I had last year and this year is to try and learn a passage of Scripture. Um, uh, it's good for me because it forces me to slow down, uh, because as you memorise something, you've got to understand it well. Um, but I'm actually not very good at it. Uh, and so I tried to learn a psalm last year, and this is the passage I've been trying to learn this year. I'm not going to memorise it and perform it for you, because then you won't listen to it. But uh, this is the passage I've been trying to remember, and I've still got ages before the end of the year, so it's fine. Um, 1 Timothy 6.10 is, uh, is where it starts. This is how it goes. Uh, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, have wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. It's a good passage to learn, right? It's been good for me as I've tried to wrap my mind around it. Uh, why? Well, because what I'm pursuing matters. And what I'm pursuing matters just as much as what I'm stopping pursuing. Uh, uh, today, we're talking about another of our fruits of faith. Uh, remember, we're going through the growing in Christ tree. Uh, we remember, uh, you remember, we start with the roots, the faith. That's where growth starts, gets nurtured by the word and spirit. And the context for our growing in Christ is actually the church. Uh, and uh, last week we saw uh, the fruit of Christ-like service, uh, the character up the top there, the character of Christ-like service. Uh, and uh, this week, the fruit or the category of fruit we're going to hone in on is the category of grace. Uh, now, the German reformer Martin Luther said that a Christian undergoes three conversions. 
Here we were thinking we went, underwent one. And he said the conversion of the mind, the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the wallet. Uh, that is, in, in this passage uh, that, that, that I'm remembering, reminding myself of during the year, I need to stop pursuing, in my mind, I need to agree to stop pursuing what, uh, what money can buy. Then my heart, in my heart, I've got a desire uh, to, 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 to want uh, what God wants. And then as I desire what God wants, my wallet will follow. Uh, you see, uh, I, I'll be investing in what I'm desiring, uh, whether that be the stuff of this world or the righteousness, uh, faith, love, endurance, gentleness that God wants me to. Um, that is a shortcut to understanding what my heart wants is by having a look at what I'm spending. Uh, if I've understood God's grace, my spending will reflect that. Now, it's true to say that, that the fruit of grace is seen in many ways, many various wa ways and places. Um, but as I mentioned in the mission and vision of our church last week, we want to be people who are generous with our time and people who are uh, generous with our talents. And you see that in the character of service. Um, and, and so this week, I, I want to particularly look at what, what does generosity with treasure look like? Um, I want to hone in on, on, on grace. What does grace look like in this aspect with our treasure, our finances? Now, of course, there's risks of talking about money at church, aren't there? Won't visitors think that church is after their money? Well, no, because I'm going to say this. If you're a visitor here, we're so glad you're here. Uh, uh, and uh, when I say you're our guest, you are our guest. I never charge people who come over for dinner at our house. You're in the same category, right? Um, uh, we just want you to enjoy church here. Uh, and uh, as a guest, it's good for you to know that money doesn't come from the government or the diocese. Money comes from financial partners here. Uh, but uh, as uh, from members of the church to you, let me say to you as a visitor, what we want is for you to grow in your knowledge of God and his love. That's what we want for you. Um, uh, and uh, you are our guest. Uh, so that's one risk of talking about money at church. Uh, another risk is, uh, isn't it a bad look to have a recipient of money, the minister, speaking about money? Now, apart from the fact that uh, there'd be a great many charities who are very silent if this was the case, uh, they couldn't cast the vision for their charity. Uh, but apart from that reason, I'm not actually simply a recipient uh, with Jenny, we're, we're financial partners in this ministry too. Um, uh, Jen and I looked at our budget for next year and started trying to work out uh, how much we can commit to, to church next year. Uh, because I can't ask you to do something that, that we're not doing ourselves. Uh, so, so that's another risk of talking about money as a recipient. Uh, another risk is, well, um, isn't what we do with our money private? Well, it depends on your definition of privacy. Uh, what you do with your money is certainly not private to God. Uh, uh, God knows what you do with your money. It, it, more than that, he knows the state of your heart. He knows the state of our heart, not just our spending patterns, right? And, and we need to be more concerned with what he thinks of us than what others think of us. You say, okay, okay, Tom, but, but doesn't the Bible say that money is private? What about the whole don't let your left hand know what your right hand is, is doing? Uh, well, that's in Matthew 6, and that's speaking about giving to the poor. Uh, our giving at church is, is more equivalent to the, the temple giving uh, in Jesus' time that was actually pro uh, public, not private. I remember the example of the poor widow who, just, uh, who, who gave a tiny coin or a mite compared to the wealthy who gave proportionally less. How is Jesus able to teach on that? Well, he was able to teach on it because he, the disciples and the crowd saw what the widow put in and saw what everyone else put in. Uh, it, was a, it was a public kind of giving. Now, I'm not suggesting that should be our model at church, but I'm just saying that giving wasn't private then. And uh, I'm not certain there's a great deal of benefit in our shroud of, pri shroud of privacy over giving. Uh, the conversations I have, uh, the few conversations I have at church about money are always good and sharpening and encouraging. Uh, I, I remember conversations I have with people about um, the tithe, giving 10%, whether that's no longer the right principle. 
And then, well, okay, what's the principle you replace that with? Uh, those conversations are deeply encouraging. Um, they're, they're good for me. Um, talking about those things helps us to give well, uh, to, uh, to, to give appropriately. Uh, we, we presume that church is good as we encourage each other. Uh, but if money is private, how can we actually encourage each other in this area that's so close to our heart? Remembering, of course, that the God-designed environment for growing Christ is the church. So there are risks about speaking openly about money at church. But I'm convinced of this. The risk of not speaking about money is actually greater. Uh, Luther spoke of the conversion of the mind, wallet and, uh, mind heart and wallet. Uh, what we spend is a mirror of our heart. If we can't talk about our heart, I'm not sure how we can talk about growing in Christ. Now, again, I'm not sure that we should be comparing our bank accounts over morning tea. Please don't do that. Uh, but, but if there isn't a person in your growth group or a person you pray with that you can't have these honest conversations about money, uh, I worry that you might be a little bit alone. And when we're alone, we're vulnerable. Um, and that's not God's design for his people. Uh, Jesus talks a lot about money. Uh, and in the passage that Brad read for us, the apostle talks about money too. In fact, I want to go to that passage now, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, if you still have it open in front of you, because there's three extraordinary ways that, that the apostle speaks about giving money. Um, the first is that giving money is inspired by God's grace in Jesus. Uh, the second is that giving is God's grace flowing through you to others. And the third uh, giving money is something that we can do well at or poorly. Uh, let me start with the first. The first is that giving money is inspired by God's grace in Jesus. Uh, in, in the passage that Brad read for us, uh, 2 Corinthians, the apostle is making an ask for money. In these early days of the church, uh, there was a gathering of money for the impoverished church of Jerusalem. Uh, he wasn't uh, asking, just asking this church in the wealthy area of Corinth. He'd also asked the relatively poorer uh, churches in the area of Macedonia and northern Greece. Now, in making this ask, uh, he's, he's not guilting the church into giving. That's what, not what the apostle uh, is doing here. The apostle is actually looking for cheerful givers rather than reluctant, obligatory kind of givers. Uh, he says in the next chapter that God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, he, he wants their giving to be a reflection of God's grace. Uh, see how he sets it up in verse 8. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Do you see how the, the apostle sets grace in monetary terms so that graciousness might result? Uh, verse 9, this is a gospel and a sentence, isn't it? As we make Christ known to our family, friends, workmates, people we meet, we could do a whole lot worse than saying this verse, couldn't we, in explaining what we believe. Our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that through his poverty he might become rich. That is, you know what God's grace looks like. It looks like him, the son who had anything, who had everything he needed. He ruled in heaven alongside his holy father, the holy father. He had no needs. He had no wants. Unlike most Australians, he was in no debt. Jesus didn't owe anything to anyone. But of course, we, on the other hand, are in a different situation entirely, aren't we? As God's creation... We're, we're God's debtors. Um, we owe God everything for our creation. What's more, then we rejected him. I don't know whether you think about yourself like this, but, but this is the truth. Before God's work in Jesus, we are morally and spiritually bankrupt. And yet your Lord was willing to take on humanity, take on the descent into the carpenter's house, uh, into an oppressed nation, to be betrayed by a friend, to be crucified by those he came to save. With only the clothes on his back of having any value. And you know the why, don't you? It's right here. So that we, his people, could become rich. So that our debt 
could be cleared so that we could be released from the squalor and the, um, uh, the, the, the poverty that we're in before God so that we can have the sure and certain hope that we will reign with God in glory. Why does the apostle set it out like this? Well, it's a modelling exercise, isn't it? When you receive grace, you give grace. So the apostle is urging imitation. Be like him. That's what the apostle is saying. It's interesting as we reviewed uh, our growing uh, Christ-like service last week, a character of Christ-like service, we we can see the similarities here, can't we? When we recognise in our hearts that, that there that we don't have a heart of generosity, what we don't do is chastise ourselves and say, oh, I've got to do better. That's actually not the approach here, isn't it? When we recognise the lack of generosity, we go back to the roots of our growing Christ tree. We go roots before fruits, remember? We're getting refreshed by all that has been done for us by God in Jesus. Uh, Reflecting on that, immersing ourselves in that, That's what our hard hearts need, to be softened so that we might show grace as grace has been shown to us. Let's go to work on the roots so that we might see the fruits. Uh, The more humbled I am by my poverty outside of Jesus, the more I recognise my need for Jesus, the more my heart changes. Friends, if you want to hang on to your money, don't whatever you do, Reflect on what the Heavenly Father has done for us in in Jesus. That's dangerous territory. So you see here, firstly, uh, giving money is inspired by God's grace in Jesus. Uh, Secondly, giving is actually an act of grace. In fact, giving is God's grace flowing through us to others. Have a look at uh, verse 1, chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Um, And then verse 6, so we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made it at the beginning, to bring about this, uh, to to, to also to to completion, this act of grace on your part. So you see about the grace and the act of grace, verse 1, verse 6 there. You hear that language of grace. So we can see that the Church of Jerusalem uh, 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 receives that gift. When they receive it, it will be God's grace to them. But we can say this too, that when the Church of Jerusalem received that gift, that that gift is a result of God's grace working through other churches to them. It it will be God's favour to the churches in Jerusalem and God's favour through these other churches. Um, Sometimes we think of grace as just an idea, just a concept. But the church in Jerusalem will be able to count God's grace in the form of that gift. It's very concrete, isn't it, grace at that point? I I don't know whether you've thought about yourself in this way, but God's grace doesn't just flow to you, it actually flows through you. Uh, That is, when you set up your payments for church and put money in the box, uh, not not because you're feeling obliged, not because you want merit, but just because out of a sense of generosity, a sense of cheerfulness, what you're actually doing at that point is an act of grace. Uh, You're both responding to God's work, And God is working through you. That grace from God is going through you to the ministries of the church. It's so people can be welcomed, so uh, so, so, uh, kids and youth can be taught, so that church services can um, feed people with God's word. And even when there's no staff costs, there are still building costs, insurance and tradies and utilities. You you have houses, you know how this works. Of course, it's not just God's grace flowing through you to the ministry of this church. It's God's grace flowing through us as a church to the Congo, to the BCA churches, to the Christian group at the Western Sydney University, to Cobham Juvenile Justice Centre, to, to the chaplain there. Uh, to each of those situations, God is, uh, God's grace is flowing through us to them. That's extraordinary to be part of, isn't it? That is to bear God's fruit of generosity, that God's fruit actually grows on our trees. That's actually quite extraordinary to be part of. Now, of course, it wouldn't be grace if we we wrote to Bishop Musamungo in Congo and said, Bishop Musamungo, I want you to know that God's grace came through me, through us, right? That wouldn't be grace, would it? It's like uh, 
this is one of the lines of one of my favourite hymn songs. May his beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win. May they forget the channel, seeing only him. A as you give here, you're part of something quite special. Hopefully it will be forgotten by others. Uh, hopefully God will get the glory because really it was his to start with through us, right? God's grace flowing through us to others. Uh, and so secondly, giving is an act of grace. In fact, giving is God's grace flowing through you to others. Now thirdly, as a church, giving money is something that we can do well at or poorly. Uh, some churches do evangelism really well. Uh, some churches have great kids clubs during the holidays. Uh, some churches do great social welfare work. We recognise about things. Uh, we recognise things about what churches do. Uh, and another category is here giving. It was clear that the Macedonian church was good at channeling God's grace in their giving. Uh, it, it's astounding, really. Have a look at verse three. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing this service to the Lord's people. They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. The Macedonian church did this well, giving even beyond their ability. It sounds like the widow's might, doesn't it? Giving beyond ability. We know it's possible to max out credit cards. It's also possible for a church to max out its giving capacity because that's what the Macedonian church does. That was something that they excelled at. They exceeded the apostles' expectations on this. But as this letter is written, the jury is still out on the more wealthy Corinthian church. And so the apostle says, verse 7, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in the love we've kindled in you, see also that you excel in this grace of giving. That is, channeling God's grace in giving is something we can do well as a church. Just like faith, fruits of faith. How, how you speak, how you think, how you love, how you give is added to that list. Giving as a church is something that we can do well out of poorly. And so, friends, we see here that giving is something that, as a church, we can be good at, we can excel at. Now, of course, as a church, we can show grace in other ways other than giving. We can be cheerful, we can be thoughtful, we can be compassionate, we can be understanding, we can be hospitable. All those are attributes of grace. But none of these things are grace unless there's some kind of cost. Sometimes giving money can be less costly than giving time. So more giving is not the answer. More grace is the answer. Uh, we're responsible as a church to steward the opportunities that we have been given well and graciously. Imagine yourselves on a plane. You're uncomfortable. Because let's face it, you are always uncomfortable on a plane. Uh, you want one of those plane cushions. You know the ones I'm talking about, those small ones, right? Uh, so you press the buzzer, air steward comes over to you. Could I please have one of those cushions? Of course, sir. And the person behind says, oh, yes, me too, please. And then three people behind them, yeah, oh, yeah, us too, please. Uh, everyone's uncomfortable. The steward goes away a bit flustered, promising to return. Half an hour goes by, no steward, no cushion. Finally, you spot the steward and ask, um, uh, where are the cushions? Oh, sorry, sir, I don't know where they are. Later in the flight, you're still uncomfortable. Let's face it, you're more uncomfortable. Uh, you get up to stretch your legs. As you near the back of the plane, you hear that blissful sleep sound. You think at least someone is comfortable. As you get closer, you see the person asleep is actually the air steward. The air steward is sleeping on a pile of 100 little cushions. <laughs> They're sleeping like a baby. That is the steward that the apostle doesn't want the Corinthian church to be. 
that is the steward. Uh, that all of God's, with all of God's gifts uh, that we don't want to be. How do you avoid it? Well, it starts and ends with grace. It doesn't start with obligation. It starts and ends with more grace. So first, we need to be inspired by God's grace in Jesus. He who was poor, that we might become rich. It starts and ends there. Uh, second, we give as an act of grace, that that grace flows from God to us and also through us. And thirdly, this is something that we as a church can do well. We can be like the Macedonian church, which is so much better than the air steward lying on all those pillows. It starts and ends with grace.